Hello folks, this is Tom from anti-proton.com and I'm going to talk to you today about satellites and how we can see satellites and maybe like catch them on a, a camera. Wouldn't that be cool? And now, I know what you're thinking, thousands of dollars of worth of equipment, now nah, you don't need any of that. I'll show you how to do it for pennies on the dollar if not for free, as well as with better stuff. So, so let's get into this. First off, um, let's get rid of this camera here for a minute. Let's talk about what a satellite is. Technically speaking, because you, you know I'm always technical, right? Technically speaking, a satellite is any one object which spins orbits, if you like, around another object. You're like, but doesn't that make the moon a satellite? Yes, the moon is a satellite. If, 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 if astronauts throw waste into space, that's spinning around, that, that's a satellite. Old spacecraft are satellites. Hubble Space Telescope, International Space Station, Soyuz craft, comets, well, not comets. Comets aren't really, no, comets are. Comets are satellites of the sun, but they're not satellites of us, of course. Things that spin around us are satellites, right? Okay, so that's a satellite. Now, for the purposes of this video, we're only going to be talking about, like, human-made satellites. We're not going to be talking about planets and that kind of stuff, even though they are technically satellites, too. But we're just talking about the ones that most people think about. So the big, you know, aluminum foil-looking covered device with solar panels that spins around and and brings you your, your, your TV signal or whatever. Okay, so that's what we're talking about, okay? There are a couple different types of satellites. We'll get into that quickly. Uh, first off, there are, there are actually many different types, but there's a couple quintessential sorts of orbits they can have. You can have something called a low Earth orbit. These are satellites that are very close to the Earth and they spin very, very fast. And as you watch them in the sky, many of you have probably seen these before. You've seen the little dot flying across the sky that looks like a plane, but then you realize it's not blinking and it's very, very high up and moving really, really, really fast. Those are usually low Earth orbiting satellites. They have orbital periods of maybe as little as 90 minutes and maybe a little bit longer than that, a couple hours. They're pretty quick as they go around. Um, oops, let me bump the telescope. There are also higher up orbits where the, the Earth is spinning. See, the Earth is spinning and the satellite is also spinning. The two of them are kind of keeping time with one another. And even though the satellite's moving, compared to somebody on the ground looking up, it does not appear to be moving. Those are what's called geosynchronous satellites because they're in sync with us. They're actually moving. They're moving so fast that their, their, their orbital period, the time it takes them to go around the Earth, is 24 hours. Hmm just like our orbital period. So, of course, that means that they apparently don't seem to be moving. So, those are a little bit harder for you to catch, but I can show you how to do those, too. And there are also some weirdo specialty orbits and things as well. All right, so let's get in to when to see them and how to see them and what to see them with and all that sort of stuff, okay? All right, so you want to look at satellites, huh? Well, how do you do it? What do you do it with? And when do you do it? For starters, satellites are illuminated by the sun, just like you and I. So the way we can see everything here is because the sunlight is hitting off of it, bouncing off of it, and our eye is seeing it. But the sun's pointing at us. As the sun starts to go down, objects that are high up in the sky can still see the sun, even though the sun has gone down. Of course, the sun doesn't go down. The Earth is spinning, so let's just all understand that. But, you know, from our perspective, it's going down. So as the sun goes down, so the best time, or comes up, so the best time to see satellites is going to be just a little bit after the sun goes down, <clears throat> or just a little bit before the sun comes up. So early morning, 4 or 5 in the morning, you know, just before that glow starts to occur on the horizon, or at night, maybe half hour after the sun's gone down, gone down. I don't See, I don't even like to say it's gone down because, you know, it, does, it doesn't go down, the earth is turning, but whatever. So, so basically put, those are the two best times to see satellites, and you can see them all day and night. Well, not daytime. Well, actually, you can. If you, if you are in a really bright, if you had a really, really good pair of binoculars or something, you saw a really bright satellite, like the International Space Station, you might, might be able to see it during the day. It's so bright. So anyway, uh, but definitely during the night, you can see them all night long. But those are the two best times to see it. Now, let me tell you about the one piece of equipment that, that money can't buy, and it's called a clear, dark sky. It's the number one most important thing in all of the entire Earth. I don't care how big your telescope is. I don't care what equipment you have. I don't care how good you are. If you don't have a clear, dark sky, you gotta look. Clear, dark sky can make even cheap equipment work wonderfully.
So let's start out with equipment. The most important thing is your eyes. You can see lots of satellites with just your eyes, huge numbers of them that can be seen with your eyes. The best thing to do is go outside, and if you're in, if you're in a clear, dark area, like you know you live out in the woods, someplace, just get a chair, sit down in the chair, make sure you put some stuff on to keep the mosquitoes and ticks and stuff off, and just sit back, close your eyes, quite literally, and give yourself about 10 or 15 minutes to start getting adjusted to the dark. If you're in a residential area and you've got these horrid little orange lights all over the place that they always have those yellow orangey lights, find a place that's like kind of behind your house where those lights aren't and just put one of those little masks over eyes. You know those sleepy ones, the little cloth black mask that have the straps around them? Put something like that on so your eyes become adjusted. Once you are dark adjusted, so your eyes are adjusted to the light, you'll start seeing satellites. Now the full adjustment the full chemical changes that go on inside of the human eye that allow you to see in the dark can take 45 plus minutes, and if you're older, it can take even longer. That's why, if you ever notice, you go to bed and it's all dark and like you can't see anything, but then like an hour later, you wake up for whatever reason, you're thirsty, you want a glass of water, and weirdly enough, you can kind of see everything in like kind of black and white. That's because your eyes have light adjusted. And once they light adjust, all these things you never thought possible become visible in the sky. So, do that. That's number one. You can see a lot of stuff with just your eyes. Number two, let's kind of increase binoculars. Now I know what you're saying. I hear this all the time. People are like, ah, I don't want binoculars. I want a big scope. Believe it or not, even with the biggest telescope I have, I still use a pair of binoculars to find stuff. They're very useful, especially satellites, because they move so fast. If you're trying to like log a telescope, sometimes that can be troublesome. Sometimes it's fun just to look up like this and find the dumb things and follow the nice, slow movements and watch them go by. Lots and lots of fun, especially if you're trying to get kids interested, because kids, it's hard to get them interested in things. So a pair of binoculars will do you very well. The biggest, widest opening you can get in the front of them. The bigger the opening in the front, the better. Don't get those little, little tubey, cheapy ones. Get ones that have a decent opening in the front of them. The, the, the wider, the better, because that lets in more light. And that's the key. You want more light. So, once you've mastered binoculars, you can move into telescopes. Now, let me tell you about the three types of telescopes available to you. These are the three basic types of telescopes. The first type of telescope is called a refractor because it refracts, it bends light from an objective lens in the front, actually back here in this one, but whatever, and an objective lens in the front that you see through, and it's bent and it focuses and then comes out in a little tiny itty bitty lens back here, a little eyepiece that you can look through. So. This is what's called a refractor. Basically, light goes in, and then comes out this little tiny peephole right here. See, people. You can look through the, the eyepiece and see things. This is kind of the quintessential telescope. When most people think of a telescope, they think of this design. This is the old tube telescope that everybody's always seen. They come in two types. Acromatic, which is um, basically, it's the cheaper kind. There's a problem in the lens where the three ba major colors, red, blue, and green, don't really focus in exactly the same point. So you can have troubles with these things. If you look at bright objects like the moon, sometimes they get a weird halo around them. But if you're just looking at satellites, this kind of guy right here is perfectly fine for you. The better version of these is what's called an apochromatic, and those are often called APOs. You'll see the term APO put right over, right in front of them. And you'll know you're looking at an ap um, uh, apochromatic because the price will be five, six hundred dollars plus, where these guys right here can be fifty dollars to a hundred dollars, two hundred dollars for something like this. Now, let me give you a warning of what not to buy. Do not buy anything like this little guy right here. This little cheap plastic crappy thing. You see these all the time. They're, they're called department store telescopes. All the pieces are like flimsy and like they don't they don't really work too well and they just sort of fall apart and like they don't focus correctly. The lenses are horrible. They, they distort the image really badly. It really, it, it's called it's called um, a chromatic aberration. It just dis destroys the image. Even for looking at satellites this thing is no good honestly put. It's just You'd be much better off with something like even a pair of binoculars and one of those cheap ones. Like this cheap plastic lens. Oh god, just, just chuck. Okay, this guy right here suffers from chromatic aberration because it's a acromat, but it's actually a pretty good quality acromat for the price. So before I get any hate mail on this, for the price, this is a pretty good acromat. 
and it will do a much better job than the cheap one. Buy yourself a good telescope. I'll, I'll put some links in for good telescopes to get, because you don't have to spend thousands. You can spend 60, 70 bucks and get a, an okay telescope to start out with. Just don't get the wrong type. The next type of telescope you can get is a reflector. It's different than a refractor because light comes in the front, but it isn't focused onto a single point. It doesn't refract light. Instead, it goes through, hits a mirror in the back called the objective mirror. That mirror is like one of those makeup mirrors that, that if you ever look at a, in like a makeup mirror before your eye is like humongously expanded because the mirror uh, magnifies, this has the same sort of idea. The, the mirror compresses that light into a little central point. And if you look inside, there's actually a, another mirror inside of here that it bounces off of, You're cutting at right angle. So light comes in, bounces back, magnified, and then reflects and goes out a right angle, allowing you to see out of the eyepiece. So in the same technique, is the same technique is basically occurring. Light's going in, being made tiny, being squished into a tiny spot, and then bounced out of a lens for or a eyepiece for you to look at. So this right here is a reflector. Reflectors, pound for pound, you'll get a, a wider aperture for, for less money, but they do require that you go in there and tinker with them a little bit every now and then to keep them calibrated, which is not that hard to do. Don't be afraid of stories you've heard of how complicated that is. You can look up on the internet how to do it. It's really simple. You're just sitting there adjusting a few screws here and there and looking through the thing to see if it's calibrated right. It's a little more complicated than that, but you get the idea. The benefit of these guys is that for 200 bucks, you can get a wide, nice wide aperture, lets in lots of light. So if you're looking for satellites, you'll actually be able to see them really, really well. And you can get a nice, easy to use telescope that'll last you a long time. Bigger bang for the buck, I think, but a little bit more at work to use. So that's your trade-off. These do not suffer from uh, chromatic aberration, but they do suffer from a few light distortions around the edge. Anyway, the last type of telescope, I don't have one of to show you, but I'm going to describe it to you. Um, it's called a uh, catadi... I always say it wrong. Catadiotroptic. I, was, I probably said it wrong again. Basically, it's a mirror lens. It works like this guy. It has a mirror in the back, so light comes in, bounces, comes forward, but instead of coming out of this eyepiece, it travels back down the tube again, and there's a refractor telescope built into it, so then it goes through the refraction telescope piece and comes out the back. Now, you may have seen these type of telescopes before, because they look like this telescope, they have, but they have glass in the front. This one's open in the front. I can put my hand in it. They have glass in the front. They have that little circle in the front blocking it, which just disturbs a lot of people because it doesn't make sense. But trust me, it works. And you look through the back of them. So that's how you can tell. If you look through the front, right where you're looking out, you're seeing a, ref a, re a reflector telescope. If you look down the back and it's long and tubey, you're looking at a refractor telescope. If it looks like this big thing right here with a little black circle in the front, glass, but you're still looking out the back, then it is a, 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 a catadiotroptic um, telescope. I'm going to put the words from that up above because I never say it right for whatever reason. I, I don't know why I don't say it right, but anyway. So last but not least, we'll get into cameras and then I'll show you how to actually do it. Photography of satellites is super fun because you get to look at satellites through a telescope or a camera or something and then take photographs and show your friends. So let me give you some tips on how to do that. First off, you need to get a digital camera. This is um, not mounted very well. This is, an old dia this is an old film camera that I don't use anymore, but I just wanted to use it as an example because it's a good quality one. It looks a lot like the one I'm actually using to record this video. So basically put, you want to get a, a wide angle lens. Now most of you aren't going to get a really good high quality wide, uh, wide angle lens. They're kind of expensive. You're going to get something like this, 18 to 55 millimeter zoom lens. If you do, put it on 18 millimeter, or the lowest millimeter you can get. But that, what you're doing is you're adjusting the focal length of the lens. The, the smaller the number, the wider the angle you get. Now you might say, but Tom, we want to look at, up, up at the sky and see something that's high magnification. We want to like telescope up to it. Why would we want to go to the widest angle, especially since 50 millimeters is about what the eye sees. So if I'm going down 18, I'm seeing wider than the human eye. Why would you do that? Very simple. When you photograph, you're going to hold the shutter open for a few seconds. That's right, a few seconds, not a click like you're used to, like click, click like that. During that time, as the satellite flies by, you're going to catch all of that light, just drinking that light up. You're going to see more than the human eye can see. You want a wide angle of field so you can catch the, 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 the satellite.
Now there's many websites that let you go out and find satellites that you can see, and I'll put links to those in the bottom. So you can see that there's going to be International Space Station flying over. At 7.05 p.m. it will appear due south at this exact angle, in right beside this particular star. And you can look that information up and point your telescope right at it. And as it goes by, you can catch that in high magnification. But a lot of people aren't too good at doing that. Or it's just kind of like a quick thing, or they don't even want to hunt a specific satellite. They're just going to catch any satellite that they can find. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you're going to do that, you want to have a wide angle of view. So hook, take off this humongous zoom lens here. By the way, these things are awesome. Those big zoom lenses. And stick on this, this. This guy doesn't fit on this camera. Fits on that camera. Stick the, the wide angle lens on in place, and then you can catch wide angle, uh, uh, wide area of fields of view, which is important. Many good telescopes, by the way, if you want to use a telescope, many good telescopes allow you to actually screw, like this guy right here, screw an adapter mount on. Once the adapter mount is attached, you can actually take the telescope and you can use it as a giant zoom lens. By the way, if you're into nature photography and you've been looking at those $10,000 lenses that they sell, this is a cheaper alternative you got to get this lined up right. It's, there are a few downsides to it. Um, I didn't screw this on very tightly. But anyway, there you go. I, I didn't screw this on very tightly, so that's my fault. Now we have super telephoto lens for 100 bucks. Um, it's not going to touch like the $10,000 lens when it comes to its light characteristics, but it's not going to be too bad for the price. A camera like this can be mounted onto a tripod and again used for catching photographs of satellites. But in this case, what you want to do is you want to use a lens, a telescope like this that has a wide angle of view. This one does, for example. And so you'll be able to actually see your satellites. All right, let's go over a few settings that you'd want to use. Okay, now the kind of camera that you want to use is called a DSLR. To give you an example, this is a Canon DSLR. And of course I use this camera itself to actually do my videos so I can't use the camera to show the video so I have to use another one. Anyhow this DSLR is a perfect type of camera to use and there are many others like it for catching satellites. Now you can use actual imaging CCD astro imagers and stuff but those cheaper astro imagers, the $100, $200 types that, uh, are, that, that are really designed more for planets aren't going to uh, do a very good job because they're, they're not designed for this kind of Photography. Now, there's many different uh, dial settings that you can use. You have um, oops, focus, shutter priority, aperture priority, um, auto, fully automatic, a bunch of little random settings. The one for you to use is called Manual M. In every single DSLR that I've seen, in fact, all of my SLRs from years ago, they all have a manual setting. If you don't have a manual setting, ew, I don't know what to tell you. That's not good. So you should have a manual setting. So let's get this thing hooked up. Oh. Sure, I don't get the reflection of the light there in, in the screen. Now, <clears throat> there are a bunch of settings to, that you can modify. The ones you need to look at are first off, the ISO. Oops, shaky, shaky hand. The ISO refers to ISO, International Standards Organization. Um, ISO refers to the actual gain of the image. It used to refer to the speed of the film. And to make it simplistic, the higher the number, the more picture it picks up the more uh, the less light you require the more sensitive the film is that's maybe a good way to put it you probably want to set this for the highest number that you can set it to something like 6400 don't go too high some some cameras have pretend ones that go really 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 high you know 65500 where don't 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 use those don't go over probably 6400 if you can avoid it the next thing to think about is your f, the f number. Now the f number is probably not going to, that, that refers to the size of the aperture. That's probably not going to make a big difference for you because when you take the lens off to connect this to a telescope, this number is just going to go bleh because it, the camera doesn't know anymore what the f-stop is. So we're going to ignore that for now. The third thing to look at is the speed of the, the photograph. This is 1 20th of a second. We can adjust that oops, to something like 1 second. 2 seconds, 4 seconds, 8 seconds. Um, what I do is I usually put it to 30 seconds or bulb, which means to stay open until you let go of the shutter release. But 30 seconds is a good good setting to put it to. There you're going to catch a lot of light for a while. 
Now, you want to set the camera to have a self-timer. And the reason you do this is because, notice how my camera is shaking. See? Shake, 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 shake as I'm trying to do the video. Um, that's because I'm holding this camera in my hand without a tripod. And when you touch the camera, it's going to jiggle all over the place. So setting it to... Jeez Louise. Shaky, shaky, shaky. Setting it to a 10 second timer gives the camera enough time for the shakingness to go away. Right? Otherwise you're going to basically have shakes all over the place. You won't catch anything. Alright, <clears throat> now we need to connect, now that we've set this, we need to connect this thing to the actual telescope. You need to take a sample photo or two and get this thing in focus before anything goes by. And if you are going to be using this without a telescope, just with the lens itself, then you want to make sure that this F number is the lowest number you can get. And if you take a photo that's super bright, you might actually need to crank some of these settings down. And I can go into more detail if anybody wants to, but I just want to give you an idea. Normally you're trying to pull as much light as you can. So let's connect this to a, to a uh, telescope. All right, so here we have a telescope. I have my Orion short tube. Pull the little end piece off here so we can connect this. Come on out, come on out, there we go. All right, to make this hook onto this, there's a couple ways to do it. You can buy a T adapter like this. This little guy, well actually this is a 2X Barlow lens, I think. Whoops, no, wrong one, but this is okay, this will work. This thing right here can fit inside. See, it goes in just like a regular eyepiece. Fits in like a, a regular eyepiece. And what it does is it screws onto this, which mounts to the, to the camera. Let me do that for you. Hold on. All right, so now we have this thing screwed onto the front of the camera. And then we can fit it, let's get that in there, into the telescope, tighten it up. Obviously, I'm doing this one-handed, so this wouldn't be any good. And now these two are mated together. And if you look through this camera, it's like looking through a big telephoto lens. So think of this as just a big variation of one of these things here, just like a regular lens, except a humongous telephoto lens, right? Now, there's a better way. Some telescopes don't require a T-adapter like this. Some of them can do it without a T-adapter. So I can't do this one-handed. Let me show you. As you can see, <clears throat> I removed the ring from this thing, and it actually screwed right onto this, right onto the focuser of this telescope. Some can do that, and you should look to see if it can do that before you get it, because that can be an extremely useful tool. Then you can take the camera and connect it directly. Let me do that. Now, there we go. We've connected the camera directly to the telescope. It's upside down right now. I'm going to kind of figure that. But the point I'm getting to is this is now connected. It's even better than connecting it with one of these. So you can do this either way. Or, of course, you can just use a lens by itself. And these are the steps that you'd want to use to connect something like this, like this telescope, to hunt down satellites. Now, I actually recommend normally, if you can, just using regular lenses. I really recommend that, at least when you're starting out. If you're going to be all special about it and you're going to find exactly where you know, the International Space Station is going by and you want to catch it, or you want to do something neat, like you know the International Space Station is going to pass right over top of the moon, right across it, and you want to catch like the two of them together, then you'd want to hook up, hook up something like this. So there you go. Now let's look at some photos of what you can expect to see.